something that has evolved out of internet culture mm. is like folks will come in with so much data in their brain and 74 things that they're doing for themselves. And they're, they have had to be in this situation where they had to be like their own doctor, their own naturopath, their own nutritionist. Like they just have been trying to heal themselves mm -hmm. and in a very honorable way, they're just doing what they can, but they come in with like, this like bucket, like overflowing bucket of strategies. And sometimes it's like first steps are like, Hey, tell me everything that you're doing. Like genuinely, like, what are you doing? And it'll be like 700 things. Like, obviously that's an exaggeration, but maybe it's 70, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's like 70 things that they're, that they have put on themselves to manage their experience. And like, yeah, it's, and I think for me, like, it's, it's just honest conversations about like, can I, can you give me permission to help you? Yeah. Because I think that you've got a lot on your plate and you've been managing a lot and I want to take on some of that bucket and, and get them out of here. And can I do that sifting for you? Like, will you give me permission to do that sifting? Because I'm looking at the bucket and I'm just like, whoa that is so many strategies let's pare that down hey everyone it is irene lyon and welcome to another long form interview with my friends colleagues chelsea and mason they are of the health creation lab they are naturopathic doctors physicians and um, when i say they're colleagues i mean that in the sense that they are also in the helping and healing professions obviously, as naturopathic physicians. Um, they are not somatic experiencing trained or Feldenkrais trained or somatic practice trained. However, they are trauma-informed and in that we connected and met through my online programs um, and also my in-person workshops. So they understand the nervous system. They understand trauma. They see the body holistically. We get into sort of just what is a naturopathic doctor? How are they trained? Really basic 101 stuff. I also pose them a question as to if you saw someone with this type of problem, how would you go about diagnosing? How would you go about treating? It's a really great conversation. Um, I'm just really excited to introduce them to you. And of course, we talk about how they can, how you, I should say, can get in touch with them after you check out their energy and their information and their love of treating the whole body through naturopathic medicine. Enjoy. All right. So hello, you two, Chelsea and Mason, my in-house naturopathic doctors. Welcome to Hi. this chat. Hi. Hi. Um, so this, I want this to be really casual and informational for people watching this whether it's through my feeds or your feeds when you share this um, and I wanted to just start with and this might be a testing your testing how you define things in a short paragraph but if you could define naturopathic medicine I want both of you to define it in your own way how would you define naturopathic medicine in our current times even mm -hmm. yeah oh the current twist yeah who wants to start mm, I'm, I'm just letting it like percolate if you're sure. ready to rock and roll sure um we can rock and roll um naturopathic medicine in a paragraph or in a summary <laughs> so naturopathic medicine is a system i would call it of knowledge wisdom information that really empowers people and the way that it does that is that um, it really emphasizes the fact that uh, the doctor is there to support the patient and their innate healing capacity. So what that means and how we can dive into that further is we use tools as a naturopathic doctor um, in naturopathic medicine that are varying in scope. So we use different therapeutics that, that, um, that are necessary for that individual. So mm -hmm. it's very whole person based. Mm -hmm. And in that we get a real good understanding of the person mm -hmm. and then what tools are right for that person. Um, 
all of the tools in naturopathic medicine are very gentle and natural in nature, as the name implies. Yeah. Um, there is a different approach when looking at people in working with that healing force rather than against it or suppressing mm -hmm. it. Um, so that's my, that's my initial glimpse into naturopathic medicine. Love it. And I'll ask some follow-up questions from that, but we'll, we'll head to you, Miss Chelsea. What, how would you define naturopathic medicine in your field, mm. in your body? I'll build on what Mason was saying. I think the, uh, the, the word like whole person is so important in my understanding of naturopathic medicine because when we see a human being and we're sharing space with them and we're trying to understand their, their experience, they are um, a collection of mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual components. And the holism that we have the honor of perceiving is like a, I guess the shape of a sphere comes to mind because yeah. it's, um, it just captures the, the entirety of their experience. And so that is what we endeavor to do is to understand the entirety of someone's experience. And like Mason was saying, we then pair that with individualized or customized tools. So it's basically like the inside out and backwards approach of a this for that. So that's not the approach. The opposite or our approach is like, what is the whole picture? Who is this being? It's always about the individual right here in front of us and what do they need and what tools are perfectly matched for their experience um, to get them to their goals. And so I guess it's, I don't know, maybe a little ethereal because it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's so nuanced with every person, but as a, as a, just a really big picture sentence, that's how I would describe it. Because all those tools, then obviously the art and the science of what we do is not only listening and having the ability to take in that whole picture, that whole story, but then our skills and training is, is finding that match. What exactly do you need, this individual sitting in front of us, and what, what tools are the best match? And that's why we you know, have all this training is to figure out the match because that's actually, um, that's the fun. Yeah. But challenge as well it's like investigative work like private investigative work with the system right yeah i want to get into the therapeutics you mentioned that term nate mason when you were describing naturopathic medicine from your viewpoint in a little bit but chelsea you said something that reminded me i wanted to ask you what is your training because i and i'll i've seen some naturopathic doctors in the past i know you guys through us being in the same city. Um, a little while ago, you trained here in British Columbia outside of Vancouver. Um, Mason, we met through one of my programs. Chelsea, you've come to one of our workshops. Um, and so we have more of a collegial student, but still, you know, we're, I consider our, ourselves colleagues, even though we're not studying the same thing. When I saw a naturopathic doctor a little while ago, well, years ago, it wasn't the best experience because it was more like, just give me the supplements. There wasn't really an intake of everything. So my sense is just like with any profession, there's going to be some people that aren't so great and some people that are a little more holistic. And I love the fact that you talked about ethereal, ethereal, the sphere, that kind of getting into all the nitty gritty, but what is the training? Like, cause I think people might think, Oh, it's just a, easy training where you learn about herbs and that's it. But I know that's not true um, because uh, I remember how stressed you were Mason when you were in school. <laughs> and so it's real med school, right? So tell everyone what you two go through as a maybe prerequisite if one of you guys want to cover what the pre requirements are and then how it's structured. And then even like the kind of exams you get, like how, yeah. Give me an overview of that so people understand. Totally. We would love to. Please. I feel just as you, just as you mentioned, like it's so, it's like this big unknown. Like, like you said, every, like we went to like Hogwarts for a weekend or something, like, <laughs> you know, it's like, 
like we like like you said it was serious like we were stressed it was the big leagues so yeah, all, work. like i'll go into the preamble and then maybe you can go into the okay the med school and then and then like you said then there's even exams it's a never-ending saga so we um in total for me this journey has taken 10 years mm. so that was five years of an undergraduate degree and then five years of naturopathic medical and so the undergraduate is going to be i think it because um, because of the nature of naturopathic medicine, it isn't, there isn't going to be like just the one degree that you need to get in. Like, for example, I have a bachelor's of science in psychology. Mason has a bachelor's of kinesiology. So there's a bit of a range of what people have done in their undergraduate, but there's always, um, a pretty robust amount of science because we have basically the exact same pre-medical re- like education as someone applying for conventional medical school, like chemistry, biochemistry, physics, like calculus, Calculus, like all the biologies, like, you know, so many different ologies, all of them, you do them all, you know, you like you do them all. And that just is what it is. Um, And so, yeah, you get some sort of science ish related degree and like some folks did other degrees. Like I think there's some people who maybe were in business, but that Mm -hmm. means that, every other course that they took as an option was science. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, so then you get your little booty through uh, undergrad and then you try mm-hmm. and recover or you don't. And then you, whoop, you go right into medical school. So you get there. Yeah. You get naturopathic medical school. And, and I'm assuming, is there like the version of an MCAT, but for you guys, is there an exam that you have to take to, to like prove that you've at least got, the basics how does that work yeah that's a good question that's the one difference that's yeah. the one major difference with the prerequisites is that we don't um some people do write the mcat because they're applying yeah. to naturopathic medical school and the medical oh, wow. school at the same time yeah um depending on what route they're trying to mm-hmm. figure out what's best for them but um you don't actually need that um they just look at your grade point average and your um obviously all your social and community um experiences yeah. but that is one difference And that's so good. I mean, actually, um, I did kinesiology here in BC. So it sounds like we have a similar background, Mason, um, which is here in Canada, exercise physiology, science, and other countries, kinesiology is a different, it's more energy medicine from what I know. Um, But one of the reasons that deterred me from even considering going to medical school was I knew that I wouldn't be able to pass that exam because I can't it's my brain doesn't work that way. Um, I can study for tests, I can pass them, but that high pressure, everything in one thing just doesn't. So I never, I thought about going to med school and I was like, nah, it's, I just know I'm not going to get there. So in another lifetime, maybe I will go into naturopathic medicine. Maybe. Anyway. So no, that's a good distinction. Thanks. For, I'm glad I asked that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's an important one for sure. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm cat. No, I'm cat. Um, so you once get you, in. Yeah. you get in, you um, typically the program's four years long. Mm-hmm. Um, we, Chelsea, Chelsea and I both did it in five just because we felt that that was a better um, experience for us. And we were soaking in so much knowledge that we were just turning into a big sponge and uh, <laughs> or a brain on sticks. Brain on, <laughs> brain on sticks. Stick, yeah. uh, so four year program. The first two years are very heavily science-based, a lot to do with biochemistry, pathophysiology, everything to do with understanding the human body from a scientific point of view. Mm -hmm. And then in adjunct to that, you have all of what we call your modality classes. So simultaneously to learning everything about physiology and um, anatomy, all those things, you're also in the different modality courses like uh, traditional Chinese medicine, Mm -hmm. nutrition, homeopathy, physical medicine. So we have a very robust training in anatomy, um, biomechanics, and also doing soft tissue work. So that basically means like muscle trigger points, um, Mm -hmm. adjustments as a chiropractor is licensed to do. So we learn everything about um, the axial skeleton and all the joints and how to, um, manipulate those and care for them in a sports medicine like fashion. Um, 
And then we also learn about herbal medicine. And I think I touched on nutrition, but that's a big part of those modalities is we learn um, the phytochemistry, the drug, drug interactions, and the healing properties of over 160 plants and um, different mineral substances, um, all that. And once you get through those two years, then you enter into clinic. And the school in BC is very interesting in its approach in that you start your um, internship in the third year rather than some schools just do it in the fourth year. Yeah. So it may differ from the six naturopathic schools in North America, but then you're in clinic and you're working with people right away as soon as you get into the third year and you're working um, under the license of a supervisor mm -hmm. who is a current naturopathic doctor, usually with 10 years or more of experience, sometimes less, sometimes way more, but that's pretty much the average. And when you get through that, in your fourth year, you become your own clinician, a primary clinician, we call it, and you are seeing clients one-on-one -on -one with limited supervision just when um, it's necessary for um, help or yeah. um, legalities. So that's the time that's really exciting because we got to, yeah, have our own clients and work with um, supervisors that we really resonated with. And yeah, we saw a lot of cool cases, a lot of cool um, patients in our internship like residency. Mm -hmm. so and then, oh, then, yeah. and then, and then, and then I forgot about this and part. Then the and then, probably the because I'm still. And then, thinking, are you still um, traumatized from the exams? <laughs> pretty much. And then there's tons of exams. Um, and I guess before the exams, on how we prep for the exams, is that yeah. we have quizzes every week, um, just constantly refreshing. Um, the naturopathic medical schools that I know of, they sort of reinforce this model of learning where you're constantly revisiting things and linking systems together yeah. instead of just studying and then cramming for that end test like in university. It's a different setup, which is really good. Um, as uh, becoming a naturopathic doctor, you need to integrate a lot of that stuff. And I find that the other uh, educational model, it often just goes in one ear and out the other. A hundred percent. That's really great to hear yeah it's um it's it's really upsetting and uh, tiring sometimes <laughs> to hear when you have a test coming up every three days but um in the end i'm glad and i think chelsea is too um about the knowledge that we've um yeah synthesized and held on to mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah it really gets in there you yeah. kind of it just don't even have a choice at that point because you repeat it over and over and over and over again in mm -hmm. so many different ways and then, so you graduate. Oh yeah, you graduate. You graduate, you wear like this big poofy gown. Yeah, fun party. Fun party. And then um, by this point, you're like totally bagged, but you get all of the energy you can possibly muster. And then you study for a month and then you write um, North American board exams. So those are regulated across the entire continent. And then depending on where you choose to practice, you'll also do your provincial regulatory exams. So in Ontario, there's a written component and there's a practical component, right. and, um, and in BC, there's a practical component. So every regulated, uh, every regulator will have their own uh, requirements for that. So then, yeah, tons of exams. And then at some point, you get, a, you get an email from your regulatory college that says, you are a naturopathic doctor, and it's a good day. That must have felt good when you got that email. Oh, for sure. Uh, the, oh. Yeah, because the one test, the NPLEX it's called, um, it's a big acronym, but the NPLEX test is three days long. Um, yeah. It's three days. So once you get your big pass, your PPPP, it's, uh, it's a good day. Yeah. It's a three day long exam in person. Are seeing people writing, like, tell me what that's like. I'm, as um, an educator myself, now I want to know what happens in those three days. So the written exam is three days. So you go in and it's basically an on paper exam and you're there for the morning and afternoon for three days. Um, then most of the um, practical exam, it's usually done within a day, sometimes two days, depending on which province you're in or mm -hmm. territory um, or state, I should say. But the practical exams involve different sections of where we need to be competent and they test on those sections. 
So there's um, a physical exam section. So mm -hmm. you're, you're given a condition or a um, problem and you have to perform the physical exam on a model or a, um, on a model, someone that's there to just be your body to go through. Mm -hmm. And um, then there's different sections like that X, Y, and Z, like the emergency medicine section, you just get hammered with all these different emergency scenarios, anaphylaxis, um, asthma, stroke, heart attack, what would you do? What drug would you give in an emergency scenario? And how would you handle it? Um, yeah. So that's kind of the, yeah, the, the written is just long and it's very, you're very um, invested in it, but the practical is a, uh, it's very practical in nature and it's uh, like adrenaline central because it's timed yeah. and you just got to be like, boom, boom, boom. Cause if you don't get it out in the little tiny window, then it's person no dies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got almost like a first responder quality to it. Right. Like learning how to be that ambulance person. Like what do you do quickly with this? Curious, because I actually realize I don't know this answer. Do naturopathic physicians learn um, anything that involves incisions or wound, like stitches, like yeah. that kind of medicine yeah. that I would only see as allopathic? Or is it primarily, again, there's this assumption that it's only about herbs and homeopathy and food, but do you also, can you refer? Can you prescribe antibiotics? Can you do a wound stitch up? Yeah, yeah, awesome question. So yeah. when where we were trained in BC, that province has one of the largest scopes of practice in North America. So our education included wounds, um, sutures mm -hmm. of, of a variety of types. So we, we did um, suture labs and prescribing pharmaceuticals is also within the scope of naturopathic doctors in BC. So those docs in BC are like, they can, they are like hundred percent primary care. Like they would be able to manage almost anything that walked in the door. Um, whereas where we are now in Ontario, pharmaceuticals are outside of the scope. Mm -hmm. So we have all this training, but we'll just, that'll just be a nice adjunct. Um, but we will not be prescribing pharmaceuticals and uh, sutures uh, and lacerations wound care is also outside the scope in Ontario. So that'll just be in the brain, but not. Yeah. Being... Is that common that it's not, or is it common that it is? If you consider the history in the world, like in other countries, do you know? Um, I, guess, I can only speak from like North America. Naturopathic okay. medicine is very, it, it's, yeah, it's very um, dependent on, yeah, continent to continent and its regulatory bodies, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, I know some of the states that have more of a progressive scope, like Oregon, California, um, Washington, Washington. Mm -hmm. they have similar um, scopes in, in regards to, or in um, yeah. BC. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know how many naturopathic doctors are doing a lot of um, minor surgeries. Um, but it's, I don't know if it's too common. Yeah. I yeah. would say probably not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it would be sweet. It would be sweet to be doing like little stitches every, every now and again, but I don't yeah. Yeah, know how often people like all of our colleagues I'm like running through like the Rolodex. No. I don't know if I know a single one who's actually doing stitches in practice. Mm -hmm. It's more yeah. something you would refer out to the ER if, that kind of thing if you had to. So let's yeah. talk about, um, you mentioned therapeutics and that's like a huge, huge subject, but what would be like the th when you said therapeutics, how would you define that? Like someone comes and, you know, and, and again, I'm new to this. So at what point do you, do you try, let's just say someone's coming in, they're having skin problems, right? And you have, you do the full assessment, psychology, emotional health, activity, diet, spirit, where they live, are they in a clean environment? Do you start with, let's try one thing, as opposed to let's bombard this person with all sorts of changes where you might not know what's making the change? Or is it really just, does your intuition guide that? Mm. 
Mm. That's a good, good question. question. Mm. Love it. Me being someone that originally went to naturopathic doctors for skin condition. That's mm. why I'm curious because they didn't get deep enough, I think, into my trauma history. Mm. Right. And I know you two have the trauma informed piece on. So curious how like someone comes with an insane rash on their body, let's just say hypothetically, and they have tried cutting out foods, they've tried steroids, and it maybe gets a bit better, but just comes on back. How would you address that hypothetical person? Mm. You two can back and forth if you want with that one. It's mm. a gooder. That's a good one. A good um, one. I I think I would start with what what we always have to start with is a uh, a very vigorous maybe not vigor is the right <laughs> word but <laughs> a, a thorough very in depth medical history. Mm -hmm. um, and for Chelsea and I, we usually take upwards to uh, an hour and a half to two hours to do that. Oh wow! Because you can't gather that data in five to 10 minutes. And there's just so much there with um, a skin condition and just that person, what their um, family history is, what their personal medical history is. So we start with a huge history on understanding what have you been through, what um, has happened in the past and like, what is your understanding of it all and how do you relate to everything you've been through? So I would say that that's the number one thing that we start with. Mm -hmm. And there are some people that will throw a million things at something just to sort of help alleviate that suffering sure. and help, help some symptom relief. And I think that's needed sometimes. Um, Chelsea and I operate, I think a little bit differently in the sense that we try to narrow it down to the basics. So we try to look at, well, we've been studying, we've been studying pathology and, disease management for many years, but we've also been studying what makes people healthy. So that's often where we start is, let's look at your environment, like you touched on earlier, like what's going on in your environment? And that's everything from food, air, um, relationships. People, yeah. People, big time people, mm -hmm. and self relationship. Yeah. So what's going on there? Mm -hmm. And then we try to just gently, but effectively, provide some nourishment to those areas. So if it is an area that we think needs some support, we'll use one of those therapeutics that I think we'll talk about here in a bit to yeah. sort of help the system out. And in this case, the, the skin or um, dermatology, we, we often have to think, okay, what is the skin's relationship to the person, but also what's the skin's relationship to the other systems in the body? So yeah. how is this person's, um, microbiome functioning how is this person's um, endocrine system functioning and which system the skin but also which secondary system do we need to work on um, mm -hmm. so that's that's a big part of what we do and a lot of those uh, solutions or things that we try are um, they're working on the skin, but oftentimes they're also working on some of these other things. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and I'm like, uh, and it's like, sorry. Yeah, no, please. Um, the, I was just getting so excited to talk about the skin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't want it to fall out of my brain. You were saying like the, the skin, um, Oh yeah, the skin, this is what I was gonna say. So the skin is really interesting and I, you were totally like your intuitive um, thought about like, I don't think they got deep enough. Yeah. I think is right on target because the skin is one of the last things to heal. Mm -hmm. um, and we know this from like our, we have learned from um, this lineage of elders and there's actually a way that healing unfolds in all these kind of layers. And so we can see patterns and we know that one pattern is that the skin is one of the, the last systems to heal because the skin is so intimately connected to a variety of deeper systems. Those deeper systems need to heal first. And then the, the, the clearing starts to manifest at the skin level. So like Mason was saying, mm -hmm. like honing in on, um, what, what system is 
it needs the most support. Maybe that's endocrine, maybe it's the liver, maybe it's the kidneys, maybe it's the emotions, maybe who knows, right? For every person it's different. Mm -hmm. And um, finding that like a root, um, root cause, honing in on that root cause. And then like Mason said, creating the conditions for health. So it's not, mm -hmm. and this is our, our unique and personal approach. Some naturopathic doctors, as you alluded to, will have a different kind of strategy. So there's this wide spectrum of professionals all these different approaches. But for us, it's like, we're super old school in that it's always about creating conditions for health and um, using the therapeutic order, which is like a fundamental tenant of like super old school naturopathic medicine. Um, and so we literally have this philosophy that guides us. And, um, and so it's like basics, the foundations, what are the barriers, identifying those core systems that need support and then layering in those therapeutics that are going to help stimulate the natural healing ability. And even at this level, we still, when we're layering in therapeutics that are like that, that good match for whatever needs support, we still haven't given anything maybe for the skin technically, like, you know what I mean? Maybe you, we still haven't gotten there or maybe we have, maybe the skin is so inflamed and it's so bothered and we're like, okay, we got to get something on there topically because you yeah. totally need support. Yeah. But we know that we got so much other work to do like under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said something, uh, gosh, what was it? The therapeutic order. Um, am I right in saying that? Bef before we get to the therapeutics, just an example of how you might work with therapeutics and what those actually are defined. How, what is the therapeutic order? And I like that you said you two are kind of old school because I think that's a long lost art. Even when a person has studied something like naturopathic medicine, even in my field of study, which is working with the nervous system, as you know, and all these very deep, deep practices, it can get, or these deep practices that are very holistic can also, they can become hijacked by a westernization Oh my gosh, yes. Right? So how do you see the therapeutic order for how you two like to practice? Mm. And you could both speak to that from your own personal, even experience um, in learning this. What would you say? Mm. I'll go first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, I heard an inhale. He's it's going like another to exam. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fun exam, though. It's a fun exam. Uh, so how I view this is I often give an example of one of my mentors. Um, and what he taught me is that um, basically he taught us this therapeutic order. And how it looks is you want to get that good baseline like we were talking about earlier, but um, in a case like the skin, per se, um, you want to remove the obstacles to cure is what we call them. And you want to remove the obstacles. That's the number one thing you do um, before you start adding on, like you're saying, layering all these different things on. So often what I learned best in that stage is how can we take things away rather than adding them on? We often think in like this Westernization culture that we need to just push and push and add another supplement, add another regimen, but often it's taking one away and that's usually what that base level is. That's um, great. Yeah. So that's, and that could take weeks just to talk about that and figure out what's going on there. Um, and you see some pretty powerful results just by taking things away. And that could be anything like a food, but it also could be a practice or a behavior that that person's doing. Because a lot of people think something that you're ingesting and, and that kind of thing, but it, it could be... Um, that toxic thing you do after work that has nothing to do I, that with goodness, but it's just this habit that doesn't serve the nervous system really and how it impacts everything. Right. So it's, it's many things that you could take away. Oh yeah. Many, yeah. Really, many things. Yeah. And there's a lot of behaviors more so than the foods and the sensitivities and the allergy or the um, food sensitivities. Um, yeah. Lots of behaviors. Mm -hmm. Is there a behavior that's like the one that you guys see the most that is, or is there like a top three that you find is so consistent against people in the Western world? 
Mm, I just got mm. one. Yeah, go I ahead. Uh, yeah, you. I, I this is I. This will just be one, and then you can share a few others. But the one that just instantly came to me is like, peop, I think this is like an evolve, like something that has evolved out of internet culture mm. is like folks will come in with so much data in their brain and 74 things that they're doing for themselves. And they're, they have had to be in this situation where they had to be like their own doctor, their own naturopath, their own nutritionist. Like they just have been trying to heal themselves mm -hmm. and in a very honorable way, they're just doing what they can, but they come in with like this like bucket, like overflowing bucket of strategies. And sometimes it's like, first steps are like, Hey, tell me everything that you're doing. Like genuinely, like, what are you doing? And it'll be like 700 things. Like, obviously that's an exaggeration, but maybe it's 70, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's like 70 things that they're, that they have put on themselves to manage their experience. And like, yeah, it's, and I think for me, like it's, it's just honest conversations about like, can I, can you give me permission to help you yeah. because I think that you've got a lot on your plate and you've been managing a lot and I want to take on some of that bucket and and get them out of here and can I do that sifting for you like will you give me permission to do that sifting because I'm looking at the bucket and I'm just like whoa that is so many strategies let's pare that down you're almost being like a coach in a way in a way right like it's it's almost behavior change strategy but in a way right yep. like assessing what the situation is and and this is where it's interesting is when you have the position you're in where you are certified you've done your training they know that you have all this information for food and supplements and therapeutics but when you the good doctor is saying you've got to change these behaviors. It almost comes, and I'm making an assumption here with a little more clout. Mm. Does that make sense? It's like, mm. you've got, you've got the history and the education and the science. Therefore, if someone at that level is saying, let's, let's clear out this basket of all these things, there might be a little bit more of a, I don't know, like um, a seriousness to it. Yeah. That makes sense. I don't know if I'm getting, be, being clear there. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. I guess that would be a hope that when we make a suggestion, people are like, okay, I'll, I'm going to listen to that. Mm -hmm. And then some people don't want to listen. And some yeah. people have like a, a personality style that's like, don't tell me what to do. And so we have to even literally work through those sorts of relationship snags yeah. because we're not interested in, in making changes or, or, or listening to maybe an authority or something like that. And so there's also those nuances of just like being in relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and navigating that in a good way. Totally. How about you, Mace? Anything that um, comes to mind about behaviors that you see? Maybe they're all in that bucket that Chelsea just made. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, what I see most often is um, like a behavior that's often integrated with some sort of uh, like physical um, action, whether that's like eating or gambling or uh, drinking mm -hmm. or something like that. But it's like there's this physical product that's the the driver or the 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 product, and then there's also this interesting social um, cultural connection that they have to it. And I think oftentimes I see that there's sort of this trilogy behind like the product that's, you know, dampening their system, decreasing their health. And then there's the cultural social interaction that goes along with it. But then deeper underneath of that is like this disconnect from self that mm -hmm. um, truly is what they're yearning for is to understand like what is the disconnect here what's the resistance but these things are just often filling a void um, mm -hmm. but it's like this interesting trilogy that i see and to get behind those layers takes time and trust and whatnot but um that's that's what i see mm -hmm. yeah. good one Lovely. do you as naturopathic doctors 
uh, physicians have the same Hippocratic oath that the medical doctors do if you do no harm? Do you share that with them or is it slightly different? Hmm. I don't know. That's a good question. We, we have an oath mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what oath um, other doctor or yeah. conventional doctors take, but we have our own um, specific one that yep. um, has been yeah. passed down. Um, it is different though. Yeah, it must um, be different. It's very different actually. Yeah, because ours is like very naturopathic in its yeah. its promises. I don't actually yeah. know what the Hippocratic Oath is. I should Google that. I don't know what they specifically have to say. Yeah, yeah. It, there is very similar thread lines of like doing no harm. Um, they just become more specific of what are like going back to the philosophy thing is just yeah. into into our Definitely. So let's talk about therapeutics. Like when you say that, what is that, what's the, uh, what does that encompass? And it's probably a lot, but if we were to go back to our person with the skin condition or the, the trouble, what might be, and maybe this is not, this is a redundant question because each person is going to be different based on what they need or might need to take away or add. But first of all, how would you define therapeutics and how might you decide on what concoctions to put together for that person? Hmm. Concoctions, good word. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking sure. at your background. It's got the little beaker and the... <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. totally. I'm staring at that going, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> concoctions. concoctions, yeah. We love concoctions and remedies and potions and... <laughs> Yeah, all of the above. Um, yeah. I guess we have like a palette or like a toolkit or um, a tool belt, some sort of a something of like our core modalities. So that's a language that we were given in school is mm -hmm. modalities. I'm, I'm not so sure I resonate with that language anymore, but um, mm -hmm. at least the, the tools, that's more of my word. I like that word. Yeah. So there's botanical medicine. Mm -hmm. Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. homeopathy, mm -hmm. nutrition, physical medicine, mm -hmm. counseling, mm -hmm. and hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy. Oh, mm. I love hydrotherapy. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Yeah. So I think those are our core tools that we get uh, educated in very elaborately in school. And then from there, each naturopathic doctor will define their own personal toolkit and start to really hone in on what, what they resonate with and where their gifts are oriented. Mm -hmm. And so Mason and I are doing that in our own ways or finding these therapeutics that are a very good match for us personally and also work well with clients. Yeah. Um, for skin, how, how would you use some of your tools? For oh, this? skin. Yeah. Or do yeah. you use some of your favorite tools in this skin example? Oh, yeah. thank you for directing me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, skin, okay. Um, and even if you, you know, maybe if you're thinking about a, a case study, someone that came to you, and if you can remember, or if there's like a, I don't know, is there like a clap? Probably isn't. Like, oh, when it looks like this, chances are it might be these tools that I use. And I know that everyone's different. So curious how you go into that. Hmm. I think the first thing that comes to mind and what I believe is one of my strongest tools is my ability to gather data. So like Mason mentioned, that intake or that health history experience, 90 minutes or more, mm -hmm. is um, the tools that I'm working with of data collection are something that I'm really refining because for me, for me to match those therapeutics, I need to know like exactly where we're at and what we're talking about and specifically what the experience of a client is. And I get pretty like deep about that. I really, I'm like genuinely curious, like what exactly is it like to be you with oh, your son? Got it. And that, those details, that rich data is just like, this beautiful, rich, abundant earth that we can start to build strategies from because that's how like we can get so tailored, so customized mm -hmm. if I know exactly what your skin experience is like. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be part like step A for me, data collection. And that is using my mind, very analytical, very medical. And then also for me, it's also very intuitive. 
I'm, I'm listening with all of myself, not just my ears and not just, you know, typing on the computer. Yeah. I'm uh, sensing what I feel in my body and it guides me and to ask other questions. Mm -hmm. And so there's an intuitive element as well. And so that's kind of that process in itself is therapeutic because that will be the first time for the majority of people that they have ever, ever said what they feel genuinely to another human being mm -hmm. and have them listen. Yes. And that is, I believe, so incredibly therapeutic to just tell your story and you can just talk and talk. I won't interrupt you. You can just go on and on. And maybe that's why we need more time. Maybe you just really need to share. Yeah. And I'm going to just listen and I'm going to be gathering data. And at some point we're going to get to a point and I'm going to feel it in my body, but I'm also going to see it on paper and I'm going to be like, okay, I have a plan for you. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll be that sweet spot. It'll be like, yeah. okay, I've got enough data. I think, I think I know where to start and then layering on therapeutics. So for skin, I feel like there's always going to be like a deeper piece there. Yeah. Um, I believe, I think yeah. for most things, there's, there's something deeper, mental, emotional, spiritual. So that's always kind of like, you know, back burner. I don't, I don't need to understand that as a person because it's not my work to do, but to acknowledge that that's present for that individual. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's where a therapeutic of homeopathy comes in. Um, it's one of my favorite tools mm -hmm. to honor and acknowledge that those more subtle layers of that experience mm -hmm. and start to really get at the root. And yep. then there's always going to probably be some element of detoxification. So mm -hmm. through that data collection process, I'm going to find out what organ system needs it. So let's say liver, for example, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be like, okay, this person's on this kind of medications. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pick um, milk thistle mm -hmm. to support the, the detoxification pathways in the liver. Cause I feel it's not really optimal yeah. and I feel that it's a safe match for their medications. Mm -hmm. And um, I would start chipping away like that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And little hydro in the mix. I think hydro. Hydro is good for everybody. Yeah. Like constitutional hydro, for example, is something we do. It's super old school. Honestly, like very few folks do it anymore, but we love it. And it's a, a combination of hot and cold water, towels, electrotherapeutics, pumping blood and lymph. It's like a big rinse cycle. And it's so yeah. nourishing. And it's like PNS like just gets you in that rest and digest nervous system so yeah. beautifully. Uh, so that's also maybe something in the mix for skin. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned hydrotherapy and Mason, I want to hear if you have anything to add, but, um, and I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I've been studying a lot of Edgar Casey's work over the last little bit. And he was huge on hydrotherapy, huge. It was like buckets of chapters and pages of all the different things from salt fats to to, to cold, to hot, cold, to how you come out of the tub and what you do afterwards to allow the flow and the flushing to end, whether you cover yourself up, whether you don't cover it. I mean, it was just so comprehensive. And one of the easiest ways to get the circulation going when a person can't vigorously exercise. Yes. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I really appreciated that old wisdom. So when you said hydrotherapy, that was great because you just don't hear that very often. Mm. No, and I, I think just because we're all lovers of hydrotherapy here now that we know, um, a lot of people don't know that the, the historical context of naturopathic medicine actually comes from uh, Europe. And these early healers were just using water, herbs, and these lifestyle factors. Mm. And people would be um, coming from all over the countryside to visit these um, nature doctors, they used to call them. Uh -huh. And that's sort of where the, the name and a lot of the history behind naturopathic medicine is in these water cure therapies, they used to call them. Um, from foot baths to full body hydrotherapy to these knee gush and these um, therapeutic sits baths, like the history there is so rich and um, yeah, very, uh, very odd when you tell 
patients that come in when they're sort of expecting like maybe some like functional genetic testing or something that we're going to wrap you up in cold and hot towels and then wrap a really nice warm wool blanket over you and make you sweat. Um, it's quite, it's quite fascinating, but it, it does work and it, it's, it's honoring that, uh, that system that's, mm. that has evolved with water and has evolved with, uh, yeah, more of this, uh, nature based approach. I love it. Uh, maybe we should do a special episode on hydrotherapy. That'll be the next one because it's true. I had a sit bath just the other day. Um, and it is, it is very interesting when you think about, um, hot springs, sauna, steam, it's much more prevalent in European countries. Yeah. I find, um, especially it, it's, it's just people go and they bathe and they, they, they get hot, they get cold, um, and they're together and they're all naked. I mean, it's just, there's this, there's this bonding too. It's very healing. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, let, yeah, let's talk about that a bit more. Cause I'd love to like go through all the different kinds of hydrotherapy. I think that'd be fun. Oh, to yeah. Play with that. oh yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, and anything else Mason to add to the therapeutics that Chelsea mentioned about skin? Um, because of course, again, it could be so many, I mean, it could be someone's gut that's totally off. I know that in the little bit of studying I've done of Casey's work, he felt that a lot, if not all skin conditions, uh, originated in the gut. I know from my experience, my skin was due to chemical trauma, exposure to too many chemicals. Mm -hmm. And so it came out in the version of like third degree burn looking types of stuff. So it wasn't my gut. Um, so there's also that individual factor, but curious if you have anything to add about skin. Yeah. Um, I'm a little less intuitive when it comes to my approach to skin than Chelsea, I would say. Okay. And I often am trying to support, uh, oftentimes the digestive system. Um, I'm happy that you mentioned that because oftentimes, um, the building blocks that we need, um, you know, we need proper assimilation for. And then um, I'm also a big fan of using plants, um, whether that's topically or internally to kind of get those processes going. So mm -hmm. what that looks like sometimes is um, a simple calendula salve, yeah. um, maybe help some eczema or dermatitis. Um, mm -hmm. Also what made me think of this from your history is that when that, um, chemical trauma, as you mentioned, came out. You need to be really aware of that. And what I think we have an understanding of is this, this term called suppression. Mm. And if you were to stop that process in its tracks with some sort of um, herb even, I yeah. guess what I'm trying to say is that just because something's natural doesn't mean that it's always good. It's the way that you use it. So... Um, it, I just, I'm just really careful on, um, trying to determine if this is something that has been suppressed. Cause if not, we want to honor that and allow it to express itself. It's going to be so tough with skin uh, stuff. That's, right? that's the very FBI investigation work. Yeah. Because, um, one healer I worked with, she did pendulum and frequency work, body dowsing work, um, helped me so much. And she took great interest in my case because she actually had an uncle who killed himself because of a skin condition. Mm. And I can believe it. It was, if I didn't have my husband, Seth, who you both know, if I didn't have the ability to not work, because I didn't have to work, it would have been very difficult to survive with what was, what I was feeling. I couldn't sleep because I it was covered head to toe, front, back, sides. Um, and I think you're correct. Like, if I had tried to stop it with going and getting a, a strong like internal injection of steroids or something like that, because it probably would have suppressed it, it would have just gone back in to come mm -hmm. out another day. And one of my mentors, Kathy Kane, who I know you've heard about through our work, Mason, yep. she gets like, when she sees a skin condition, she's excited because she, she even like, oh, goody, a rash, because it's coming out as opposed to forming something inside cellularly that you can't see mm. until it's too late. 
And so it's, it's so I bring this topic up of this skin example, because I know a lot of people have skin conditions. So no doubt someone watching this knows of someone or they have one. It's hard when you're on the receiving end and you still have that condition for someone to say, be excited that you have a skin condition yeah. and know that it can heal when you figure out exactly why it's there and it might take some time, mm -hmm. but at least you can monitor it. You can see how it's shifting and changing, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's perfectly said. And uh, <laughs> I don't know the intermingling of the nervous system theories and your mentors and how the, the body just kind of knows what it needs to do. And with the, um, I was gonna say, with the therapeutics, yeah. um, we know that like cortisol, very, very strong hormone in the body, like super, super potent. And to, you know, make a synthetic version of that, it's, it's, it's very, very strong. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that's why I like working, and Chelsea I know likes working with our therapeutics because we can sort of just support that process and um, manage some symptoms at the same time. And a lot of the herbs and acupuncture protocols and uh, homeopathy remedies that we use, they, they sort of just support the body and give us some, yeah, give us some time and give us like a little breath of fresh air sometimes that, you know, often having a skin condition, you need that and yeah. you just need some reprieve from it. You do. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to, the one thing that helps me and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I will. Um, vodka. Mm. Truth. It wasn't something that I drank by the bottles, but mm -hmm. But um, at night, when I just wanted to relax and have a little bit of downtime and not feel the sting, um, I would have a strong, strong martini. <laughs> and I don't have it now, but it was for a period of a little bit where if I didn't have that little bit, and it's, you know, it's still a natural substance, it's alcohol, it really helped. And it, that was the only thing, I, nothing else, like if it was wine, I would start to itch if it was but there was something about the purity of that alcohol that took the edge off. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I've said that to some people, I think I've shared that with some of my students and in, in my courses. And I think they're shocked to hear it because they think it's going to be some fancy remedy, some essential oil. I'm like, no, it was just pure vodka um, yeah. from a local distillery. It was potato vodka and it helped. Am I still drinking vodka every night now? No but it was something that really allowed that edge to come off because I didn't want to take sleeping pills or anything else to relax me because I knew that that would not go well with my body. Mm -hmm. um, and I did one night, I did take a sleeping pill because I was just up to here with not being able to sleep. And the trouble was I went to sleep and I scratched myself raw because I was so unconscious mm -hmm. and I did sleep, but my, but my system wanted to scratch. And so again, this is where each person has to figure out their own path. I'm not saying everybody should start drinking vodka, but um, it worked for a few, for a little, you know, for a few months. And then I didn't need it when the next layer started to come out. Yeah. 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 It was the right tool at the right time. It was, it was. Um, I wanted to talk about um, just dip into because a lot of people listening to this are here this listening because of my feeds and my channels and they're interested in the nervous system we haven't really talked about the nervous system and yet we kind of have in a side way how um do you work with it now that you maybe know a little bit more about working through the work we've done has that shifted? And I know Mason, you've done a little bit more work than Chelsea, you have, but you've done a little bit with us too. How has that information that you've learned helped how you see the human system? Like, did you get some of that information in your schooling or was it still not quite there around trauma? And it's not to demean the, or diminish the, the, what you got, but was there something extra that you now have based on knowing more about the nervous system trauma and that curious to hear how you see, how you see the systems differently? Mm -hmm. um, I am going to contain my urge to go first again oh. and ask ah. you to go because Tell I'm me. regulating here. And nice. uh, 
Yeah, so if you want to go first, I would be happy to continue. Be, be okay with that. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. Um, okay, so I would I would say um, I can recall one lecture in school about the polyvagal theory, which mm. I was really grateful to learn about. Um, an elder was sharing that, and mm. um, and so that would be. I would say that was maybe the only like direct, like thorough, not even thorough, but direct education about your field of work. Um, and so super grateful for that conversation and also super grateful to just pair it with that embodied experience of, of the up and down workshop because that was something that I really needed. There was a lot of intellectualizing about the nervous system, but it wasn't, embodied like you can sit in a lecture for three hours and learn good information but you, you need to live it you need to feel yeah. it and I think that's yeah. the power of your work is it, yeah. it brings it into experience into the day into life it makes mm -hmm. it you know like practical usable sure. it's not like brain candy so um and those certainly carry through my work just as a like as a person and also as a, as a clinician, um, that embodiment piece once once it was a key takeaway after the, the up and down workshop, the first one, like I, um, like the, the patience and the noticing of the, of my felt experience, the permission to move, how does it feel? Just just being immersed in that is something that I still practice ev every day if I can. Mm -hmm. To just you know cutting like last night, cutting a mushroom and just noticing the beautiful gills and the glide of the knife through the mushroom and and those are skills that are totally born out of your work and that I I feel are so relevant for clients as well. And like for a clinical example, like. Um, Sometimes like people can get a little bit destabilized, like depending on what we're doing in clinic. I had a mentor who had a lot of hands on work and sometimes that would bring up a lot of stuff for some people yeah. and they would be quite activated in yeah. like the clinic room. And so just orienting mm -hmm. to the environment, um, like noticing, you know, colors in the room, feet on the floor, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, trying to engage that social engagement system and like take the edge down a bit. Like those were just really simple, but so usable skills in a clinical yeah. setting. Um, yeah, that's what's coming to mind cool. right now. I mean, it's, I feel like it's really starting to weave, like just like the, the circular nature of our work and your work, like it just like, like they're, oh, yeah. Easy. Totally right. Yeah. And it's where does one begin and the other end? I don't even know, but um, yeah. Oh, and like the other day, like the I think I shared this on your Instagram. Just made a comment. Like for me, exercising oh, right. um, had triggered some stuff for me because my heart rate was really going, yeah. and that's historically always been a thing. And I finally clued in after your Instagram post that. Um, that there was an element of activation here and that I needed to titrate up and to j just give myself permission to be like, okay, this is my heart beating while I'm running. This is <laughs> normal. I'm not in danger. Look at the gorgeous trees, the smell of the air, hearing the birds and just using those little tools just to, um, uh, cope I guess with the, the the trauma as it moves and flows yeah. so great love it thanks for, thanks for sharing that and obviously take all that with into your practice like teach your students that or your clients that I guess you call them clients or patients but yeah that thanks for sharing that and I remember you sharing that we'll find that and we'll link it near this video so that they can see it and in, in the video you're talking about um, Mason, how are you doing over there? What is, did you have something to add? Well, I thought I did. I just got immersed in your story. Um, oh, how, yeah. Again, it comes, I think it comes back to. Oh, and I'll say, not sorry, not to interrupt you. It's not about promoting my work at all. It's just how has 
learning a little bit more about the nervous system helped or aided the learning that you got through your, your, your schooling, because I sense like it wasn't, you didn't get the detail. No. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. It, it has helped immensely in the sense that, um, yeah, it's just so relational working with people and knowing like that, I like that titration and I like the word containment. And I think just like Mm -hmm. how I've been able to, practice these, these, um, not theories, but like just practice, like okay. life is just practicing all these skills and things that we're learning as humans. And yeah. I think that having that ability has allowed me to really help other people, not in the sense that I, I have all the analytical data, but um, it's really helped me um, being a very like kinesthetic person and oftentimes having a hard time relating on like a, like an audio or like an oral or um, Mm. talking sense, like communication and just figuring out how do we, how can I help people communicate better with what they have going on with them right now? And because I've been able to just use some of the tools and Mm -hmm. um, regulate my own nervous system that um, I often find that that's the biggest gift is helping people to kind of get out of that left analytical mind and get into that feeling sense which we're often sometimes so scared of but so many rich rich treats in there Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and I see this often with people that um, I work with my hands uh, my hands-on work because I do a lot of sports injuries I do a lot of chronic pain and um, a lot of it is mechanical like working with scar tissue Mm -hmm. trying to help this joint out um, etc but a lot of it it helps in the sense that, okay, do you notice that you're breathing really shallow right now, really heavy? Yeah. And then oftentimes that can spiral into, uh, no, uh, in a moment of awareness and uh, some sort of little healing tidbit or potential there. Um, so good. But yeah, just, just remembering and being aware and allowing others to take, um, take that into consideration in, in the treatment. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And can I add, like, I, I yeah. just want to reiterate, like, I feel that everyone in the world needs to know about trauma and the nervous system, like, oh, yeah, 100%. Like, it is like fundamental to our evolution as beings, like, trauma is so important. And I feel like in our field, I'm, I really, I hope, I pray that we all get access to that information to yeah. understand what it's like to be a being who is traumatized and what does that mean? And how as a, as a you know, clinician, can we, how can we use that information to empower our, our connection with others? Because I think that unfortunately, the medical system, Western or maybe otherwise, has a strong um, reputation of, of creating harm. And uh, I think that we can do a lot to rewrite that if we start to get a little bit more educated about how, how we are traumatized beings and how we can engage with people who are traumatized and what does trauma look like in the body and how does that manifest as dis-ease. Any, um, any final notes? So that I feel like we've, this is our number one convo and now we have to talk about hydrotherapy in another convo conversation. Um, if you like, what are some parting words for those listening who are, you know, curious about naturopathic medicine? I mean, obviously you two are forming a practice in a specific physical space. So not everyone's going to be able to fly to you or drive to you or walk to you. Um, but as doctors, who greatly want to see humanity evolve and heal and find just beautiful abundance. What's your, what would be parting words from each of you to that person who's still knows that there's more that they have to learn and heal. And, and yes, they might have trauma and yes, they're trying to figure out the 70 things that they might have in their back in their box that they're using. You know, what would, What would be, um, Chelsea, your final parting words to people for this first conversation that we're having to give people some 
insight and inspiration? Insight and inspiration. Mm. I think that I would like to share that we all have exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. We all have the ability to be well. Mm -hmm. And we can give ourselves permission Mm -hmm. to heal. That we can give ourselves permission to be vital. And that we are like incredibly vibrant, mm, powerful, potential beings, all of us, even in our own suffering, even when we feel like that's so unrelated to our experience, like you're just maybe have the tip of a grain of a sand of that. But I think that somewhere in there, if we can continue to have faith in our ability as human beings to heal, to be vital, to grow, to trust that system, to trust our nervous system, to trust our immune system, to trust our endocrine system. I, I hope that we can all tune into that because there's something really, really healing there. Amen. Mm. Makes sense. Building on the trust piece, I think that, yeah, we have, if you're searching for answers or you're curious about a new technique or a new approach to medicine, I think, yeah, follow that and see where it goes and have no fear and yeah, just really be, be okay with the uncertainty that's going to come with your journey and also um, enjoy the really juicy, happy, joyful moments. Um, and yeah, just stay really centered in yourself and try to learn more about yourself and who works with you or who works best with you and what techniques or um, what really sets you up for success and just try to yeah follow those threads. That would be my parting words. Parting words. Awesome. Thank you. And um, I'll link your sites and all all the ways that people can connect. Obviously, if people are in, tell me the actual, if you don't mind, the town, if someone's watching this in your hometown or near you, where is your location, your physical proper location? Yeah, so we're in Sarnia, Ontario, and we, um, we're of service to people in this, the whole southwestern um, Ontario region, specifically uh, in that Sarnia, Lambton Shores area. Okay. Yeah. Great. And um, if someone wants to learn or consult or just get more information, I'm just going to say email them, um, see what you guys are up to. I know you're just starting your practice. Um, you two want a grant. Is that what it's called? To get your practice going, which is congratulations. So exciting. Um, so yes, I look forward to talking with you more and talking about specifics. So we, again, we'll have to do the hydrotherapy thing um, and talk about that. And I just encourage everyone to reach out to Chelsea and Mason and just follow their, their journey, their path. They are trauma informed. They know the ins and outs of the polyvagal theory and how all that works. So thank you to again for your time and chatting today. Mm, thank you, Irene. It's so fun you. to chat. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome to catch up and chat matters with you. Yes, definitely. Until next time. Until next time.